confident. The black bars represent the, the proportion of words that you endorse that are negative self-view, insecure, anxious. Oh, these are healthy controls. And these are adults that, di that we've diagnosed with social anxiety disorder. After three months of nothing, no change. After three months of aerobic exercise, which we also are studying the brain circuits changed by aerobic exercise, my favorite form of emotion regulation, no change, too bad. Post mindfulness-based stress reduction, the program that I was describing earlier, there's a significant reduction in negative self-view, but no change in positive. That's interesting. Cognitive behavioral therapy, I'm trained as a cognitive behavioral therapist, gold standard psychotherapy, empirically validated. Increase in positive self-view, decrease in negative self-view. We're actually now studying this over the next five years, head to head. Mindfulness versus cognitive therapy to understand how do these different types of trainings differentially affect brain circuits and self-view. Self this is very interesting. So would you say the difference between the two is one is like a, a personal activity that you do on your own to be more aware of yourself, and this one is something that's aided with, I guess, professional health and like the this interaction is, between another person? Well, actually, um, cognitive behavioral therapy is done with a psychotherapist, usually a PhD clinical psychologist. Uh, mindfulness is done with usually in a group format with somebody who's trained in mindfulness meditation, not necessarily a psychologist. Both involve lots of individual practice and group practice. Uh, this program is nine weeks. This, one, this particular version was 16 weeks. And it also does include uh, more cognitive reappraisal training, reframing. This one does not. This is mostly attention regulation. But, um, it's, but this one costs f several thousand dollars per person, this one costs 250. So anyway, I'm, not, I'm going to not show you more brain stuff, but just to say that um, this work definitely works. Um, come on. Oh, maybe it's frozen. <laughs> anyway, just to point out that we're actually looking at all these phenomena and brain circuits reactivity, emotion regulation. Um, it's done with lots and lots of help of lots of people. But I can show you just one thing, just because I think it's especially ap apropos this course in terms of uh, technologies. Um, these are people I work with at Google, where we actually created a uh, search inside yourself instead of outside of yourself. Program of emotional intelligence, mindfulness meditation for Googlers to stay well and to enhance their emotional intelligence and become leaders. Because most Googlers admit that they were not taught about emotion, emotion regulation, self-view, interpersonal skills in any of their education. You guys probably are more advanced than that previous gen that older generation. I'm also working with another company called Wishwell, which is actually a game that tries to get people to think to step out of themselves and think about others online. And then also with another private company in San Francisco that's looking at the brain circuits. How do you train these brain circuits uh, in a commercial context um, with cognitive training? And I do this with lots of people, lots of mentors, and lots of money. <laughs> <laughs> Funders, because <laughs> it's super expensive research. So thank you for your attention. Yeah. Yeah, we do many different kinds of studies. There was one that you but referenced. there was one here that we do where we actually get people to, to actually write okay. descriptions of their own autobiographical, right. painful social situations. Okay. And then their negative beliefs about themselves in that situation. Okay. And then we hit them with all of that while they're lying trapped okay. inside the MRI scanner. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering. Um, <laughs> really sweet. <laughs> um, with this conceptual self attention in the midline structure, does that have a correlation between uh, people, what they think, um, how they're going to react, what they, what they project in that autobiography of that social situation? Mm -hmm. like, is there a correlation, or are they surprised by the outcome that the brain scan actually uh, projects? So I think it's, it goes with the self-awareness question, but... Yeah, um, we do act, we, yes, we, so when you're spinning on your own negative self-beliefs or reading your own story or script, that self-circuit, mm -hmm. one, two, three, 
is activated. We actually have papers that are impressed exactly on that. And you also see that post aerobic, two months of aerobic exercise, which we did, no change. Post two months plus of mindfulness meditation training, there are specific shifts in that circuit that are, in, that are <coughs> related to the practice that actually are down-regulated. Yeah. Now, having that, but having activation in this conceptual self, like there's nothing wrong with conceptual self-awareness. It's when, again, when it becomes stuck and you don't have that flexibility. So there actually are other modes of self-processing that are not linguistic or language-based, that are not conceptually based, that are actually somatic, visceral, embodied. Yeah. Yep. Um, we're not doing visualizations, but yeah, actually, visual, there's a whole host of uh, meditation practices that are uh, incorporate visual processing, where you're actually either visualizing something that overlays on top of right now what you're looking at, or with eyes closed, you actually visualize things in your mind. There, and there are variations, many variations of both. And they can be very powerful. They're usually much more advanced. They're usually not taught to beginners. They're not at all really in, uh, incorporated in mindfulness meditation. Um, but uh, yeah, the, the whole visual back of the brain, that's lots of parts that are dedicated to visual processing, are, are powerfully influenced by the amygdala, by the way that we think, even images of ourself, right? You were generating images just a moment ago. Um, so uh, people are beginning to look at that, uh, but that, boy, that involves uh, really taking people who are much more skilled and trained. And lots of um, forms of meditation training uh, don't involve visualization. Like the Tibetan tradition really does. Buddhism in India, uh, there are many different schools, and many different other schools, they actually don't do visualizations. Um, there are some, I mean, you can imagine actually with the body scan that you are visualizing your foot, your thigh, your butt, your back. But what you, I think what you're referring to, um, most Buddhist traditions don't do a whole lot of that. The Tibetans do, Tibetans, Korean, Japanese, Chinese do a lot of that. But most traditions here, like Vipassana, uh, don't. Which is okay. It's not that one is better or worse, but um, just different traditions. Any other questions? Yeah. So I, I was wondering what, how, how well the F MRI scans yeah. for these different parts of the brain corresponded to self-report. Great question. Um, across, well, in general, um, very much depends on the experimental design. And in general, self-report um, very often does not converge with brain, brain response. In some cases, we do find that. In many cases, they don't. One, part, being a detective, one part of that is that depending on the, the, the brain imaging method you use, and fMRI is very slow. EEG is super fast. fMRI is about five seconds. Like, bam, five seconds later, you get a signal. EEG, four milliseconds. 10 milliseconds later, you get a signal. So one thing is that self-report takes seconds and seconds and a lot of self-awareness and then thinking and then language. And language comes on way later than awareness. Um, some of the brain signals are occurring in 20, 30, 40, 100 milliseconds. So that's one of the things. But sometimes we do find convergence, but it very much depends on the task and the experimental design. So yeah. Like sure. Sure. But now this is becoming, you know, even Google, like they're totally interested in all of this stuff. Um, yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, yeah, it um, might be a weird question, but you asked about something okay. to do yoga, right? Yeah. Not many people here do. No. Nope. That, um, and I've got a similar thing that where I try yoga because I know yoga is good for me. I just don't really enjoy it. Oh, then you don't have to do it. <laughs> so is it a bit like exercise where? It's a good thing for, you know, running on a treadmill is also very boring for me, but I do it because I know it's good for me. Mm. Do you also do yoga just because it's good for me, even though I don't enjoy it? I would say, um, uh, well, that's a really good question. Um, I also am an athlete, and I, more so when I was younger, but and I also run on a treadmill. I, I do enjoy it, though. Uh, I think, first of all, if you find something that you enjoy, then you're, obviously your motivation will be there to do it. So that's one thing. Um, but, but yoga, especially hatha yoga, the simpler ones, not the more advanced that are, you know, headstands and balancing, um, definitely 
if you do that, it's almost it's it's like it's like um, uh, oil in an engine. It loosens up the body to keep you more limber well into your 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. I mean, um, so it, from a health perspective, and there are re more, more research studies, yoga traditionally, the postures are only for the purpose of becoming, taming your mind so that you can actually be aware of your breath. The breath is only the really preliminary pr practice to be able to then sit down after doing yoga practice and tame your mind. From physical posture to breath to mind. It's not often practiced that way in the West. It's done more as an exercise. But um, in the East, the postures are to become more aware of your body, so you can become aware of the breath, aware of the breath, because that's a direct reflection of state of mind. So it's meant to be a meditation practice. It's not practiced that way often. But that has that component. But I do would say, um, especially if you are bi a biker or a runner, you will definitely cause certain rigidity in certain muscle groups. Uh, stretching and especially yoga practices can loosen up those muscles. Long term, it's really, really healthy. But don't do too like macho yoga where you get hurt. That you don't need to do. Lots of people get hurt. You don't have to do that. Yeah. So, anyway. Cool. Thank you so good. much. Really. Good. Good.